I'm Nadja Swad for biznews.com and joining me today is Professor Frank Ferreira. He's an emeritus professor of sociology and the author of several books. Professor, thank you so much for your time. Nice talking to you. What's your background? Well, uh, I was born in uh, Hungary, East Europe, and uh, we were refugees. We kind of fled in 1956, grew up in Canada, and then came to do my PhD in England, uh, where I ended up. Uh, was never the plan to end up in England, but one morning I woke up and I realized all my friends, all my mates were English, so I stayed here. I'm stuck here now. <laughs> I read a lot of your articles and you've observed a movement towards the normalization of violence. And looting in particular has been rebranded as a positive act, even a, a, a lauded act. Um, in psychological terms, how would you explain this? Well, I think what's happening is that there is a, a kind of a double standard that people adopt. So very often, for example, when some people loot, that's kind of called terrorism and violence and is uh, very strongly condemned. When other people are involved in antisocial behavior or, or looting, that's seen as an understandable act of people who, for some reason, are poor and they need more resources or they're reacting against the oppressive character of the system. And I think there's been a kind of loss of a political sensibility, understanding that uh, it's quite legitimate to mobilize, to demonstrate, to try to achieve your objective. There's a difference between that and when you just destroy, often very mindlessly, your own neighborhood, the properties within your neighborhood, and just lash out and uh, create far more problems than existed before you began to involve yourself in those kinds of actions. And what do you think could possibly be motivating the media to drive this message and narrative? In the media is very interesting. It, it, it kind of has become very polarized. It's very segmented. It, it's very rarely able to make judgments about behavior across the board. It, for example, I, I, th I thought it was very interesting that uh, as we're speaking, we just heard about uh, uh, Salman Rushdie being, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, attacked and being stabbed several times. And the way that it's reported across the board is quite interesting because some people, for example, will mention that the people that uh, the person has done this act uh, has been motivated by, let's say, jihadist Islamic ideology, you know, mm -hmm. by the fact that, that was declared by the Iranian government. A lot of the other media, when they, when they made the announcement, basically talked about this individual doing this and said, uh, we're not sure what the motive is, as if somehow there could be the slightest doubt as to why you would have somebody stab uh, Rushdie. You know, what was you know, I mean, the, the very idea that you're very reluctant to mm. actually uh, indicate what the score was is something that is very, very common uh, across the board, and uh, and that's very regrettable because it means that the media has become so polarized that it's very difficult for there to be any grown-up conversation or discussion between its different strands. Mm. So most of your work revolves around the culture of fear in which we live and safety, safety culture. In what ways do you think fear shaped the course of the pandemic? I think it's not so much fear because it's quite understandable that you and I uh, would be wary of getting COVID or, you know, we don't want to come anywhere near a virus that could do us harm. But I think it's the way that fear has been framed and, and the way that, you know, our relationship to this uh, virus has been uh, sort of uh, communicated so that basically what has happened is that on the one hand, uh, the word vulnerable has been used all the time so that, you know, you and I, almost automatically are turned into not so much citizens, but potential patients and virtually everybody uh, in the world suddenly becomes uh, a, a patient who's in need of support rather than as, as people with agency and the ability to uh, 
manage what is a very real threat, a very a very real danger. So on the one hand, our uh, our subjectivity, our, our our character as human beings, has been kind of downgraded because uh, there's a kind of message that we haven't got the resources, the resilience, the capacity to deal with these kinds of threats. So on the one hand, you have that, and at the same time, you have the the threat posed by the virus elevated. So these two things are going on at the same time, the downgrading of human capacity and the inflation of, of the threat. And I think that's what really kicked in uh, mm -hmm. to the point at which uh, it kind of acquired, acquired its own momentum, acquired its own power you know, in various domains of, uh, of uh, everyday life. You draw a distinction between uh, fear as an emotion and fear as a perspective. Well, fear as an emotion is very natural. I think, you know, we can fear just about anything on a bad day. I can go to a party and I, as I get to the door, I can fear going in there because I worry about the fact that nobody will talk to me and I'll be lonely and isolated, standing myself by myself at the cor uh, in the corner. So it's a natural emotion that we all have and it helps us um, make sense of the world around us. But when it becomes a perspective, uh, which is what I talk about, but when fear becomes a perspective, it becomes detached from anything specific. So it's no longer a fear of being run, being uh, confronted with a guy with a gun. It's no longer the fear of losing your job. It's no longer the fear of, the, of a virus, anything specific, tangible. Fear acquires this kind of outlook where basically worst case thinking about human experience becomes part of our outlook. And we basically, uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, regard everything, not from the vantage point of opportunity, or maybe there's an upside, but rather, mm, you know, what is there to fear? What's, what's the downside? What are the problems here? But what are the well, consequences of having a fear, a perspective of fear for human, on human development? I think what it does, it kind of uh, makes us, uh, first of all, uh, less wary of engaging with each other. So if I have a perspective of fear, I'm unlikely to come close to you and uh, become your friend or want to talk to you or you know, have intimate relationships because mm. we become estranged from one another. We no longer regard each other as potential people that will watch our back. But somehow we think that there's something wrong here. And we even got a language that uh, encapsulates that. We talk about relationship as being toxic, as if they're poisonous. You know, you have toxic you know, marriages and you know, sort of toxic friendships and toxic families even. So you have that kind of moving away from each other. But on a broader scale, if uh, we have that perspective, then the way we bring up children radically transforms because we insulate kids from every aspect of, of life. Mm -hmm. So instead of encouraging them to gain independence and to you know, take risks, we basically kind of remove them from anything that can be potentially harmful. Mm. And so that's not really good for them because they're, they develop their passive rather than their active, active side. And then you know, in terms of uh, everyday experiences in political life, in economic life, instead of encouraging people to go out and, and make things happen and take risks and to explore and to mm. experiment, we almost, you know, want people to conform to a pre-existing pattern. Yeah, it, it's it's almost as if the value of courage has been degraded, and the what concept of safety has just skyrocketed. Psychologically speaking, what are the ripple effects of a shift in collective human thinking like this? Well. I think the most important thing is to become much more uh, fragmented and isolated and atomized in terms of our everyday existence. And because what happens is that as we begin to lose connections due to the way we fear and the way we become wary of each other, we tend to become a little bit more internal oriented. So we do spend a lot of time uh, thinking and in some cases obsessing about ourselves. Uh, imagining that uh, that is, you know, that is the the only safe site where we can explore stuff, and 
as you know yourself, I'm sure that when we are we spend too much time on our own, when we left our own de- devices, we can become mm-hmm. caricatures of ourselves, and we mm-hmm. often develop very one-sidedly, and often we lose sight of what is really out there, and and become extremely uh, subjective and lo- you know lose the capacity to get a balanced sensibility of possibilities. So psychologically, I think what it does is it renders us passive, very, very passive, and, and, and makes us uh, less able to uh, communicate and, and, and really to express ourselves in creative ways. Relative to history and the objective violence that defined it, we're in a incomparably less volatile society but people are intensifying their search for safe spaces yes why do you think that is well i, I think the the safe space phenomenon is is really interesting because more than anything else it encompasses the this radical redefinition of what a person is that i mentioned earlier on where if you look at you know how we look at a person compared to other cultures other you know other historical periods we, we really do define people by their potential fragility. Just just think of the number of times you use the word trauma. This was a traumatic experience. And all that happened was that somebody stepped on your foot. right? Or <laughs> you often find that even children as young as 9 and 10, who barely, you can barely spell the word trauma. They say, oh, I was traumatized in the playground. So we kind of adopted this therapeutic language, which basically means that we do feel terribly insecure and part of that insecurity is that we are less able to handle criticism and people put pressure on us which are really quite important because i don't know about you but i flourish and i get into my stride when i'm criticized when i'm questioned when i'm forced to account for myself but if that's not seen as a threat you know as as a danger then obviously you will look for this kind of uh, quarantine around yourself where you're trying to insulate yourself mm. from those kinds of pressures. That's what a safe space is. It shows what you're saying in, for example, the DSM, the amount of disorders that were added between volume four and five is significant. So there seems to be this, this almost obsessive need to categorize and diagnose what is essentially just a normal everyday perhaps existential problem but as a mental disorder yes yes we kind of medical why do you think there's this need to do that well i i think it basically means that if you medicalize human experience if we give it a diagnosis Mm. you seem to be able to deal with it much better today Uh, it gives people a, a, a meaning and a sense of recognition so you know, in a world where our web of meaning is very fragile, where we lack clarity about our place in our world, knowing that the reason why you behave this way is because you have social phobia, or <clears throat> knowing that the reason why, for example, you find, find it very difficult to, to, for example, come out of lockdown, is because you have lockdown syndrome, you know, sort of uh, provides a kind of almost quasi-religious explanation where it makes quite a lot of sense. And if you look at the lockdown recently and the number of syndromes that were invented uh, to explain the fact that people find it very difficult to both handle the lockdown, but also to come out of it. What we've done basically is we thoroughly turn the experience of that lockdown into a, a medicalized you know, sort of experience. Is the, the prevalence of severe fear able to incapacitate other cognitive and physiological functions? It depends. I, I'm much more worried, not so much about severe fear, but casual mm. fear, when we just fear you know, without even thinking about it, when fear becomes our first response. Mm. That does have a certain uh, impact on the way you perceive the world. Because if you see... Uh, uh, everyday life through the prism of uh, it being fearful and dangerous and threatening, then it has a you know, then it has a very kind of uh, powerful effect upon the way you behave and the kind of uh, strategies you adopt as an individual to kind of manage it. So it often takes 
totally absurd forms. So one, one example, in certainly in Europe and America, is the way in which people have started, you know, over 20 years ago now walking around with uh, bottles of water in plastic and, and imagining that bottled water is necessary because the water that comes out of the tap is dangerous. And then they, you know, and, and, and it's completely nonsense because the water is no better or no worse. But then what has happened laterally is that because of uh, hysteria about the environment, we now argue that bottled water is more dangerous than water from the tap because we're using too much plastic and all the rest of that. So, mm. you know, virtually everything can be reformulated in this way and that changes your behavior uh, all the time. You've suggested that there's a the person that is likely to hate global warming skeptics is the same person who is likely to comfortably comply with things like a mask mandate. What parallels do you draw between this? Well, I, I think there is, I mean, what I'm really trying to suggest is that there is a, a kind of a sense in which a reaction to things have acquired an identity. And, and therefore, uh, you know, people, you know, like in America, you have this big debate between whether you wear a mask or not. And for some people, wearing a mask was like a, a sign of respectability and care. For others, it was a sign of freedom. Rather than just simply say, like I did, I don't want to wear a mask because, you know, I want to get on with life. You know, not because of anything else. It's just, you know, sheer comfort. Uh, so you had all these big debates where you turn minor issues into political ones. And I think the environment is really important in this. Because if, uh, like me, you argue that, uh, you know, I'm not a scientist and you know, I, you know, I have to believe what the scientists say, but that doesn't impinge on my, my personal behavior. You know, what science says does not determine what food I eat or does not determine, you know, as to what I do with my life and where I travel or, mm. you know, what, I, what, what kind of behaviors I adopt. That is now seen as like the opposite of, uh, of responsible behavior, that you, you yourself, by your very existence, become a threat to other people. And that's what happened in the, uh, in, the, in the pandemic. And that's what also happens in the environmental discussion. You kind of turn people into these kind of walking, you know, sort of uh, time bombs. Do you think that uh, well, some of the time these sort of knee-jerk reactions to fear or situations that, that could present danger... Do you think that in some parts it's attributable to the fact that our cognitive development hasn't quite caught up with our evolutionary development? I don't. I think that uh, our, our cognitive development is invariably mediated through culture. And I think it's through the cultural narratives mm -hmm. and the messages and, and the language that's around us that we use to... Um, assist or, 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 or limit our cognitive development. And I think what has happened is that the way that culture works, uh, in a sense, undermines our capacity to, you know, to uh, in a sense, develop our cognition in a much more creative, uh, sort of sophisticated direction. Not for everybody, but if, if we, for example, uh, are, are told that reading is really difficult, and you know, even though for hundreds of years, ordinary working class people used to teach each other how to read, but now we say it's the most difficult thing in the world and we mustn't uh, force children to read too early because it will traumatize them. If you have that kind of attitude towards reading and we complicate it and almost present it as a threat, then the way we read and the way we deal with words and with language becomes uh, very different. And, and, and I see this in the university in particular, where the uh, cognitive skills of our students uh, are often uh, restrained rather than encouraged by the teaching and pedagogic strategies that we adopt. Is it possible that the fear-mongering that went on around COVID, particularly in the beginning. Is it possible that that had any impact on the severity of COVID symptoms by way of the nocebo effect? I think it probably did, uh, because when uh, we live in a world where we're continually checking ourselves to see whether the, the fact that I coughed is a symptom of COVID or 
just because for some reason I got a headache. You know, it's no longer a headache, but basically the uh, a sign, a marker for something much more more threatening. Then there's a there's always a, an incentive, a quite understandable incentive, that you begin to live the symptoms to the point at which you you become your worst enemy, and that's something. Uh, many of us have done, myself included, from time to time, when we find ourselves in strange circumstances, instead of just letting go and uh, and getting on with life, we spend far too much time Googling, you know, sort of uh, medical <laughs> advice and various other symptoms, which in, invariably is not very helpful. Society has also moved from teaching principles of morality and autonomy to prioritizing principles of psychological values, of self-esteem, and those sorts of things. In what ways do you think this shift is going to manifest in future? Well, I I think the uh, important focus for me at the moment is that the socialization of young people, which historically was done through moral, a moral language, sometimes a, a religious language, uh, has mm-hmm. been displaced. So we're using psychological uh, instruments to socialize children. We argue that it's important to validate them, to uh, make them feel good, to raise their self-esteem, mm-hmm. that we mustn't criticize them too much, mustn't put too much mm-hmm. pressure on them. So uh, by the introduction of psychology as the main way for socialization, what we're doing is we're not giving kids the kind of values that give them a, a sense of who they are, what their place in the world is. And uh, it doesn't matter how much, how, how much your self-esteem is, if you don't know the difference between right and wrong, and if you haven't learned the moral language that helps you to navigate the world between what is, uh, what is good and what is evil, then you, then you kind of end up becoming psychologically dependent on professional support, you become psychologically dispossessed of your own autonomy or of being able to make judgment calls for yourself. And I think that has a, I think has a huge impact. It has led, certainly in the, in the Anglo-American world, to the infantilization of young people, where people take much longer to grow up, you know, and you meet young men, young women in their late 20s who behave like you know, girls and boys. And you know, are actually proud of the fact that I'm not a grown up yet. I'm still, you know, sort of, uh, well, you know, I'm I'm still refusing to what they call adulting, because adult yeah. is seen as, as a yeah. bad phenomenon. And I think that infantilization <laughs> and narcissistic turn in our culture uh, is is really quite prevalent. Obviously, there are many exceptions to that, but it's something you see all you know all the way all, all around you in daily life. So when the pandemic hit early 2020 and all the impositions started you know, coming down country after country, it was surprising to see pure submission, no opposition. People were very willing to trade their freedom, which our history shows we value the most um, and we traded that for perceived safety what do you think is behind this dramatic deviation from the norm well you know the ideal of freedom has has been devalued now for a very long time a long time before the pandemic mm. and although rhetorically nobody says i hate freedom or i'm against freedom people pay lip service to the importance of freedom in practice we've seen uh, a systematic cultural devaluation of it. So you have, particularly in the United States, but also in Canada and Britain, Australia, a growing tendency to call into question the value of autonomy. People say that you know, self-determination, you know, the, the, the desire to be autonomous is a myth. You know, the, the implication being that we haven't got the power to be autonomous. So what's the point of valuing autonomy? Uh, we've seen the devaluation of, of free speech in particular, where uh, there are long books and articles being written, have been written for a long time, 
that argue that free speech is overrated and and that in fact what's the point of free speech for example if you're poor you know you, you know you, you're not going to have as much power as a rich person which is true but that doesn't deny the fact that having your own voice freely expressed is important for everybody right. so you have all of our freedoms have been to some extent you know sort of undermined and culturally devalued so when freedom is seen as not a big deal and you have such a casual orientation towards it then when uh, you know, people come along and, and and take it away from you a lot of people are you know are not even noticing that they've done something unusual they think this is like a really cool thing to do and that's a normal thing to do and what you had uh, in england for example where i live is a minority of people being uh, upset about it and prepared to stand up and fight for their freedom but you know, a significant section of society being more than willing to acquiesce to this. And it's not their fault. I think it's the fault of our cultural political norms that have created the foundation for this kind of response. And then just to close off with, the prevalence of anxiety is increasing, increasing drastically. But what I find particularly interesting is that it is a collective anxiety on the rise. Is this capable of explanation with psychology? Well, obviously, psychology has got a role in explaining uh, what you describe as collective uh, uh, anxiety, particularly in specific circumstances. So you can have a situation where you have this kind of anxious zeitgeist that prevails everywhere. But then you can have a situation where in a particular school, you know, uh, you find a phenomenon of, of a, of a contagion of girls cutting themselves. And that's where the psychology comes in. So, you know, a girl sees that her best girlfriend has cut herself, has a discussion with it, thinks this is really cool, and then she does it, and then somebody else does it. So sometimes you have, you know, 20, 30 girls in the same year, you know, sort of doing that. Similarly, you have a, a phenomenon, a, it's quite an interesting phenomenon from the, from the point of view of anxiety, is the way in which uh, young people identifying as transgender, you know, occurs not in ones and twos, but it, you know, there's a kind of contagion element in there. So, in my town where I live, you know, one of my friend's daughter comes home and more or less explains to her mom that in the last week, something like 15 of her peers have come out as transgender. They're they're kind of women living in a man, uh, they're, they're men living in a woman's bodies. And you know, you don't need to have a PhD in psychology to know what is the dynamic that is going on here. Professor Freddy, thank you so much for your time. Thank I really you, enjoyed Nadia. it. Nice talking to you.